Good evening and welcome. Good evening and welcome. Thank you for coming. I'm Glenn Muth, professor and director of the Forum for Citizenship and Enterprise and Academic Center, and it's sixth year programming here on our campus. We're also providing programming for our friends in the community, and I see lots of community people when I invite you here, and I hope you'll be back for our programs in the future. Please take a minute now to silence your devices. And uh, I hope that you got a survey of your students. Uh, please fill that out. If you were here for the Rachel Sheffield program, you may have also filled out uh, a survey, but please do another one. Those are important for our co-sponsor, whom I'll we'll talk about in a minute. And we'll draw one lucky winner to receive uh, an Amazon gift card. And you can either give those to our assistants at the conclusion or put them in the box, which are on the table on the way out. Our co-sponsor tonight is the Institute for Humane Studies. Founded in 1961 and located in Arlington, Virginia, the Institute for Humane Studies advances a freer society by facilitating the development of students and scholars who share an interest in liberty. And if you have any questions about the Institute for Humane Studies, uh, please see me. I'd be happy to talk to you about their programs. IHS is also enabled by a generous uh, grant from the John Templeton Foundation the John Templeton Foundation serves as a philanthropic catalyst for discoveries relating to the big questions of human purpose and ultimate reality. And before we begin tonight, I'd like to remind you of a couple other programs we're doing uh, this semester, uh, two that are also sponsored by the Institute for Humane Studies. Brian Kaplan from George Mason University will be here on March 18th to address the question, are we stuck with the great society? And Chris Marin from the Acton Institute will be here on April 20th to address the question of alternatives to the Great Society. On March 31st, Civil War historian William C. Davis will be here giving a lecture titled Grant and Lee in War and Peace. Tonight we have a very timely question, American military intervention in the Middle East. For some, our president's recent request to Congress for authorization of military force against ISIS is discouraging deja vu that will result in an endless quagmire. To others, however, it is essential for bringing order and humanity to a region vital to American national interests and plagued with both extremism and fanaticism. Are American national interests best served by active military intervention in the Middle East? Here with us to debate that question are two of America's finest policy analysts. Arguing for military intervention, on my left tonight is Max Boot. He is Jean J. Kirkpatrick Senior Fellow for National Security Studies at the Council on Foreign Relations in New York, and one of America's leading his military historians and foreign policy analysts. He has also served as an advisor to military commanders in Iraq and Afghanistan, and also to political leaders. He has been one of the nation's most prominent voices in support of winning strategies in Iraq and Afghanistan. He is author most, most recently of the New York Times bestseller, Invisible Armies, an epic history of guerrilla warfare from ancient times to the present. The New York Times book review said of Invisible Armies, it is thoughtful, smart, fluent, with an eye to a good story. And the Wall Street Journal said, Mr. Boot's impressive work of military history is destined to be the classic account of what many, of, excuse me, what may be the oldest as well as the hardest form of war. He is also author of War Made New, Technology Warfare in the Course of History, 1500 to Today, and The Savage Wars of Peace, Small Wars, and the Rise of American Power. Both have been placed on professional reading lists by all four major military branches. He is also a contributing editor to a number of uh, uh, journals in both print and on the web. He's a frequent speaker and guest on radio and television programs and has lectured on behalf of the U.S. State Department and at many military institutions. He hold his, holds his bachelor's degree in history with high honors from the University of California, Berkeley, and his master's degree in history from Yale. Arguing against military intervention is Doug Bondow on my right. He is a senior contributor, excuse me, senior fellow at the Cato Institute and something of a legend in libertarian circles. Can I say that? 
He previously served as a visiting fellow at the Heritage Foundation and also as a special assistant to President Ronald Reagan. He has written and edited several books, including Foreign Follies, America's New Global Empire, The Korean Conundrum, America's Troubled Relationship with North and South Korea, and Tripwire, Korea and U.S. Foreign Policy in a Changed World. He is columnist for Forbes Online and has been widely published in such periodicals as Time, Newsweek, Fortune, Christianity Today, Foreign Policy, Harper's, National Interest, National Review, New Republic, Orbis, and World, as well as leading newspapers, including the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Washington Post. Received his Bachelor's of Science in Economics from Florida State University and his JD from Stanford. Finally, let me introduce our moderator, Professor Jim Johnson. Jim teaches political science for us here at Northwood and is finishing his terminal degree at Wayne State in world politics and comparative politics, and so he's just the man for this job. He earned his bachelor's degree at Eastern Michigan and his JD at Western Michigan. He has served as a lieutenant commander in the Navy, in the JAG Corps, as a line officer and also as a staff officer. He has been a practicing attorney and has practiced law internationally, specializing in corporate law and litigation, and has also been a freelance journalist covering wars and revolutions in the Middle East, Asia, and Latin America. With that, let me briefly outline our schedule tonight. Each of our speakers will have an opening statement of no more than 15 minutes. Max will go first, and Doug will follow. They'll, we'll then have five minutes where each has the opportunity to cross-examine each other. Max will go first, and Doug will follow. Our moderator will then have the opportunity to ask questions of each presenter for no more than five minutes. We'll then take a 10-minute break. Now, during this 10-minute break, our presenters will be formulating their closing statements. This may be the best part, the closing statements, so don't leave and not come back. Um, and you'll have an opportunity to ask questions. And so what we'll do is we'll have some 4 by 6 3 by 5 cards that we'll be passing around. If you'd like to ask a question, just raise your hand. We'll get you a card, write out your question, and give them to Jim. And Jim will handle Q&A when we return from the break. So we'll take a 10-minute break. We'll come back. We'll have uh, questions from the audience. And uh, then we'll have closing statements. Doug will go first, and Max will go last. And when all this is done, I hope you'll join us for cake, coffee, and lemonade in the upper lobby. With that, I'm going to leave the stage and turn it over to these capable gentlemen. Please join me in welcoming them. Thank you, Glenn. Uh, welcome. I have not seen this many of my students in one location at one time in 33 years. It's amazing what extra credit will do. Um, the resolve for our debate this evening is as follows. Resolved. Our United States national interest best answered, best advanced by active military intervention. Our first opening will be by Max Boot. Max. Thank you very much. And it's a uh, pleasure to be here with all of you and delighted to see such a great turnout. I figure a lot of you are probably here just to get out of the cold, but nevertheless, I'm delighted to have you here and to uh, be present at what I think is a pretty important, uh, pretty important debate, which goes beyond the Middle East. I think there is now, you know, Doug and I are, are friends. We've even traveled together in the past, but I think we have a, a strong philosophical difference over the course of American foreign policy, and I think it's a great opportunity to explicate our differences. And Doug, I would say, is an exponent of a school that was once known as isolationism. Today, no longer, that name is no longer in, in good odor, so isolationists tend to call themselves non-interventionists or something else. But I think that's generally the school that he represents, whereas I tend to represent the school of American internationalism and American global leadership. I mean, just last week, I was reading one of Doug's articles, which said, six allies Washington should dump from its Lonely Hearts Club. And he was suggesting that the United States should end its alliances with, the so with Saudi Arabia, Iraq, the Republic of Korea, the Philippines, Ukraine, and the three Baltic republics, which actually is nine if you count the Baltics as, as three. To me, that's anathema because I think that 
American interests are served by strengthening American alliance, strengthening our relationships around the world rather than by leaving the world behind. And that we don't really have the luxury of doing that. When we've tried to do that in the 1930s, the world paid a heavy price. The United States paid a heavy price for the lack of American leadership, as it did again in the 1970s, in the years after the loss of Vietnam and our withdrawal from the world when we had to deal with the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan and the Iranian hostage crisis. That's what happens when America is not taking an active leadership role in the world. And that is certainly true in the Middle East, which is the area, one of the areas of the greatest strategic interest in the world today. I think we don't have the luxury of ignoring a region that has 60% of the world's oil supply in it. Now, obviously, when you make the case for a militarily active policy in the Middle East, it's not easy to do these days because everybody thinks about the terrible costs that we have suffered in places like Iraq and Afghanistan. And no question that's true. And there have been many blunders, many mistakes that have cost much American blood and treasure. And that is deeply unfortunate. But that should not lead us to pull out and to simply abandon an active policy of intervention. We saw this movie once before. There were many mistakes in World War I, which cost far more American lives than our interventions in Iraq and Afghanistan combined. As a result of that, we moved towards isolationism in the 20s and 30s. We said, we don't want to fight again in Europe. It's a mistake to get militarily involved. And we saw what happened. That was what facilitated the rise of Nazism and fascism and Japanese militarism. And ultimately, it was a self-defeating policy because we don't have the luxury of simply ignoring what happens. And if we're not actively involved in trying to promote our interests and trying to promote global peace and security, what happens more often than not is that war breaks out and we get sucked into an even bigger conflict that we might have avoided early on with a prudent policy of low-level intervention. So just as the failure or the problems of World War I did not negate the need to fight World War II, so too I would argue a lot of the problems that we've seen in Iraq and Afghanistan, which I'm happy to talk about at greater length, certainly do not negate the need for an active military forward-leaning posture in the greater Middle East. The resolution before us is, are U.S. national interests in the Middle East best advanced by active military intervention? Obviously, I say yes, but when Doug says no, you have to understand what he is rejecting. Let me just run down a few of our military interventions in the Middle East over the last several decades, starting with the tanker war in 1987-1988 when President Reagan reflagged U uh, tankers going through the Persian Gulf with the U.S. flag and wound up fighting a war with the Iranian Navy to allow the free passage of commerce uh, through the Straits of Hormuz. Then there was the Gulf War in 1991-1992 when the U.S. led an international coalition to roll back the Iraqi invasion of Kuwait, to liberate Kuwait and to prevent Saudi Arabia from being overrun by Saddam Hussein. This was followed by an active policy of intervention, no fly zones over Iraq, to prevent the Kurds from being slaughtered and to keep Iraq in some kind of box in the 1990s. Another policy of active intervention occurred after the catastrophe of 9-11 when we actively intervened in Afghanistan to depose the Taliban and to chase al-Qaeda out of Afghanistan. Then, of course, there was the famous and highly successful raid that killed Osama bin Laden in, pa in Pakistan. Of course, more recently and, and continuing, there are airstrikes and drone strikes in places like Pakistan, Yemen, and Somalia targeted at terrorists who are trying to attack the United States, our people, our interests, and our homeland. And they are being kept off balance by these drone strikes. And of course, finally, lest we forget, right now, as we speak, the US Navy is patrolling the Persian Gulf. The Fifth Fleet is out there to maintain the freedom of commerce and to keep foreclose the possibility that Iran will shut one of the world's vital economic arteries. All of that, folks, is active military intervention. And if Doug is going to be against active military intervention, he'd better explain why all those interventions are a bad idea and why the world is going to be a much safer place if we pull out. In fact, I would argue to you, that's not going to happen. We've actually had a controlled experiment in what happens when America pulls back under this president who came into office opposing the war in Iraq, talking about rebalancing from the Middle East to the Far East, he pulled all of our troops out of Iraq in 2011. Back in 2010, Vice President Joe Biden said that a stable and prosperous Iraq was going to be one of the 
shining achievements of the Obama administration. Well, what happened after we pulled our troops out in 2011? Things went to hell in a handbasket pretty quickly because on the one hand, you had the unraveling in Iraq. At the same time, you had the unraveling in Syria, this terrible civil war which has killed 200,000 people, and we didn't do anything. We didn't send arms we didn't, in, in substantial numbers. We didn't send trainers. We didn't do much to help the more moderate factions in Syria, as a result of which the war has burned out of control, and it's led to the rise of the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria, this vicious death cult which has taken over territory larger in size than the United Kingdom. And they are out there uh, burning people. They're out there beheading people. They're out there committing every atrocity known to mankind. And why are they able to do this? I would submit to you it's because of a lack of American leadership. And it's not just ISIS. It's not just in Iraq and Syria. We're seeing chaos in places like Libya and in Yemen and in Somalia and elsewhere around the region, which I think has grown because this president has tried to pull back from the Middle East. And to show you how self-defeating a policy of pulling back actually is, we now have troops back in Iraq. We pulled our, all of our troops out in 2011, and now we've had to send troops back in because even this president, who has been so determined not to intervene, who has promised time and again that the tide of war is receding, even this president has felt compelled to put U.S. troops and aircraft back into Iraq because we cannot simply stand by and let a vicious and evil group like ISIS terrorize with impunity and take over ever greater swaths of the Middle East. And yet that has been the cost of American non-intervention. And it's not only the growth of ISIS, by the way. It's also on the other side. You see the growth of the Iranian-backed militias, of Hezbollah, of other vicious and extremist uh, terrorist groups that have been taking over large parts of Iraq and Syria. Essentially, those countries are being divided between Sunni and Shiite sectarians. And the, and the problems there, the chaos, the instability there has been spilling over into other countries, not only taking down Iraq and Syria, it's also spilling over into countries like Turkey, Jordan, and elsewhere, it, and, and to Israel as well. It has the potential to have much greater spillover. And that's because we have not taken an active leadership role. Now, the f at the same time as we have been largely ignoring developments in Iraq and Syria, Iran has been very busy. Because what happens when we, when we don't fill this vacuum, if this, this vacuum that results when we don't fill it, somebody else fills it. So it's being filled by ISIS and it's being filled by Iran. And Iran is not only busy supporting these terrorist groups that are taking over large chunks of Iraq and Syria, they're also on the, well on their way to acquiring a nuclear weapon. Uh, when this president came to office, Iran had fewer than 2,000 centrifuges. Now it has more than 10,000. And the U.S. is prepared to concede that Iran has a quote-unquote right to nuclear weapons or to having a nuclear program. Now that, to me, is a very dangerous and disturbing development. And again, I see that happening as a result of an American failure to lead and an American failure to show it's willing to actively intervene. What was the only time when Iran actually ended its nuclear program temporarily? That was in 2003, after the invasion of Iraq, which had a lot of problems, to be sure, but it scared the Iranians and convinced them that it was not in their self-interest to continue their nuclear program, whereas now they have ramped up their nuclear program. So what I see in the Middle East is that as we've pulled back, chaos and disorder have increased. This is threatening our allies. It's threatening us because the more that groups like ISIS or al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula are able to gain sanctuary, the more you will see what happened in Afghanistan prior to 9-11. When these groups become magnets for international jihadists, for terrorists from terrorists all over the world, including from the United States, from Europe and elsewhere, to come to these places to get trained, to get radicalized, and some of them go out and then commit atrocities in their countries of origin. You've seen that happening with the Charlie Hebdo uh, massacre in Paris, where people are being radicalized by ISIS. You're seeing it happen all over the world, including here. And we've suffered the terrible ravages of terrorism, not only in 9-11, but at the Boston Marathon bombing. And unfortunately, I think we will continue to suffer those ravages, no matter how effective we become in domestic security, as long as these groups have this kind of sanctuary to recruit, train, organize, and export uh, their 
uh, their vicious ideology from the Middle East. So I think we, it's vitally important for us to work together with our allies in the region to oppose uh, these terrorists, these extremists, these thugs who threaten us and our interests. Now, I'm sure Doug will tell you that our allies don't need us, so they can do it alone. That is just simply demonstrably untrue. We have seen time and again that our allies will not act unless we take the lead, whether it was our European allies failing to stop uh, Serbian ethnic cleansing in the Balkans, or more recently, our allies have been doing very little in Syria because we've been doing very little. Now when we start doing a little bit in Iraq to oppose ISIS, our allies are doing a little bit. If we don't act, what happens is our allies essentially cut deals with the aggressors. Countries like Saudi Arabia and Jordan and so forth are not going to stick their necks out uh, to battle ISIS or these groups that we find to be so threatening. If we don't battle them, what they'll do is they'll cut deals with them. And you'll see the Middle East getting divided between these extremist ideologies which I think are a clear and present danger, not only to American values, but also to American interests. Now that's something we simply can't afford. To oppose that, however, doesn't require this massive intervention with 150,000 troops. It doesn't require fighting another Iraq war. As I was trying to suggest earlier, if we would just have a low level steady state military intervention, we can avoid the kind of catastrophe which has occurred in Iraq since 2011. Things were actually on a good path and in 2010, 2011, when we had as few as 10,000 troops there. We pulled them out, things went haywire. Today, I think we need, unfortunately, we need to put more troops back in, more than the 3,000 that President Obama has sent over, but certainly I don't think that we're, I, I don't expect we're gonna need as many as we once had there. I think 10 to 20,000 is probably gonna be adequate because we need to work by, with, and through our allies to the greatest extent possible. I'm certainly not suggesting that there's an American military solution to every problem in the Middle East. But what I am suggesting is that an active American policy of being militarily involved in the region can catalyze our allies and it can help to lead to larger solutions. It has to be one line of operation among multiple lines of operation. It can't be the only line of operations. We're not gonna take over the Middle East. We're not gonna send hundreds of thousands of troops there. But I think we do have to stay actively involved whether it's patrolling the, the Persian Gulf, whether it's battling ISIS or other evils that arise in the region. If we don't do it, nobody else is going to do it. And this is a broader problem, by the way. It's not just the Middle East. If we don't work to oppose Russian designs in Ukraine, Putin will be able to get away with anything. If we don't work to oppose uh, Chinese aggression in East Asia, China will, start, will continue pushing American allies around and the world will get to become a much more dangerous place. Whereas I think the record shows that in the post-1945 period, when president after president, Republican and Democratic alike, has pursued an internationalist foreign policy, one predicated on American mil military leadership and global leadership, the result has been the greatest expansion of freedom and liberty uh, and security in world history. We defeated Nazism, we defeated communism, we can certainly defeat Islamism today, violent jihadism. It's not gonna be easy, it's not gonna be short term, but if we have a long term commitment, we can certainly do it, and we have to do it. We, we truly have no alternative. We cannot allow a world in which, just as once we could not allow a world where Adolf Hitler and Tojo run free, so today we could not allow a world where the ISIS and uh, Putin's Russia run free. And so therefore I urge you to support American leadership in the world, and especially in the Middle East, and, and including military leadership. Well, thanks. It's a great pleasure to be here. It's been a while since I've been at Northwood, and I think the last, last time that Max and I saw each other was actually on a trip to Cuba. So it's uh, you know, fun to be here stateside and to be talking. It, uh, you know, it's a, it is an important issue. You know, when you kind of listen to Max's presentation, I think the question is, will America ever be at peace? I mean, it's quite a list. You know, and basically the assumption is that only America can act militarily and without America acting, you know, the world will you know, basically you know, end up in a new dark age. And I think the question is, will we ever be at peace? We've been in Afghanistan since 2001. I might note we've been there not to get rid of Osama bin Laden or the Taliban. We did that initially and I supported that. We've been there trying to bring democracy to Central Asia, a very different issue and a questionable one, I think, from our standpoint. 
One looks at Iraq, of course, we left in 2011 based on George W. Bush's timetable. He didn't get himself a status of forces arrangement. And it's not clear to me what we would have done if we'd stayed. American troops in combat with rising forces. There's no reason to assume that American troops would have been necessarily well received, but instead would have been a target you know, themselves. Libya, well, what on earth would we have done after that? We didn't have boots on the ground. Could we show up and occupy the country and announce to militias, please turn over your weapons to us? Very unlikely they would have been turned over. Now we're talking about going back to Syria, and the question is, what would we do in a civil war there? Who should win? Who should govern? What happens with the killings after the Assad is <clears throat> overturned? All of these things, you know, that there's no just simple step when one goes out. I think it's important. We think about leadership. I don't know anyone who doesn't believe in leadership, but leadership suggests discretion, prudence, judgment. It doesn't suggest one does everything for everyone. And I think number one is military action should be a last resort. It's different in kind. It means killing. It means killing people. You know, it often turns out very different than expected. People normally don't go to war expecting to lose, but somebody always seems to lose. You know, the way these conflicts turn out are very often very, very different than what people assume. And the costs are high. It's not just lives, it's money. Trillions of dollars spent trying to bring democracy to Central Asia. Trillions of dollars spent trying to fix Iraq. The question of a free society, was it what it does to domestic institutions? Government, of course, war, of course, is the largest big government program around. And there's also blowback. War is not some kind of beautiful thing that one does and everybody you know, comes and applauds you and throws <coughs> you know, uh, candies at you and you have a cakewalk. Terrorism runs out of intervention. I mean, there's no more obvious way to create terrorism than to get involved in other people's conflicts. Ask the man that I worked for, Ronald Reagan, who put US forces into a civil war in Lebanon in 1983. Hardly surprising the US Embassy and the Marine Corps barracks went up because we became active participants in a war. You look at the internal strife that erupts in societies when you take out a government and don't have a governing structure to put on top. We've seen both in Libya and Iraq. New opposition movements, ISIS coming out of Iraq. New crises, virtually every crisis we see in the Middle East is a result of prior intervention. We show up, blow things up, and surprise, surprise, things don't work well and down the line we're called to come back. I think it's very important if you want to use the military, not only as a last resort, use it for realistic objectives. You want to defeat a totalitarian state, we can do that. You want to remake a society, very different. It turns out that war and the military is a pretty poor tool to kind of democratize the globe, that, you know, to try to create new societies, to try to create you know, fix a place that's not uh, working very well. What I've always found very sad is that people who don't believe in social engineering in America believe in it overseas. That one can kind of transcend ethnic differences, religion, history, geography, tradition, and fix other places. You know, Americans wouldn't stand for it. Why should we be surprised that people pick up AK-47s in other societies and say, not here? very hard to make that work. We take Americans who are trained to be warriors and expect them to be civil officers, mayors, where they're supposed to go out there and be policemen. They're supposed to fix a society in a way that they've never been trained to do. And it doesn't matter if we think we have a way to make it work. If it turns out the American people aren't willing to support what it takes, more troops, longer intervention, more costly intervention, it's not going to work. And the American people don't have much appetite, I think correctly, for that kind of intervention. It's also important, I think, to question how important some of these interests in the Middle East are. You know, superpowers have interests everywhere, but that doesn't mean they're vital. The good news about being a superpower is actually a lot of stuff doesn't matter nearly as much. That one is able to have some distance from a lot of issues and a lot of problems around the world. Energy matters, but of course, as an international marketplace, countries in the region have an incentive to sell the oil. If the Saudi regime is overturned and somebody else takes over, the only oil does them any good is if they sell it. Why would an Iran want to block access to the Gulf? It'd want to block it if it's in a war with us. It wants to sell oil. It doesn't have an incentive to block it by itself. It has an incentive to block it if it's in a conflict. And moreover, how much are we willing to spend for blood? How much in higher prices justifies going to war? One should be very careful, I think, about using that. You know, terrorism. As I mentioned earlier, intervention does far more to foment terrorism than to stop it. 
you know, if we look around the world, you talk to people who are involved in this, they complain about American support for dictatorships like the cuddly Saudis, engaging in war, dropping drones. These things have blowback. And it's not just in the Middle East. You know, why are there bombings in the subway system in uh, Moscow? It's because of Chechnya, where Russia has fought a bitter, ugly, bloody war. Until Iraq, the most prolific suicide bombers on Earth were in Sri Lanka, you know, not in the Middle East. You know, wars are not an answer to, inter to a problem of terrorism. The idea of stability, we'd love to have stability, but when has the Middle East been stable? It's always been unstable. I, I mean, um, it's created with artificial boundaries. The British have given us a lot of this problem. But we have religious differences. We have ethnic differences. We have hatreds there that you simply take off the secular dictator and everything explodes. And I would argue that virtually every American step into the region has created more instability. I mean, American involvement in 1953 in fomenting a coup d'etat in Iran gave us the Shah of Iran. He gave us Khomeini. You know, what, because of Khomeini, we have Hus uh, Saddam Hussein who attacks the Iranians. In 1987, we didn't reflag tankers to protect freedom of navigation. We reflagged tankers to support Saddam Hussein. Those tankers were Kuwaitis. The Kuwaitis were lending the money to Saddam Hussein. It was a war measure. We were involved actively in a war. If you look at Libya, you look at what's come out of that. It's been chaos. ISIL, Islamic State, wouldn't exist but for the invasion of Iraq, not for the lack of American troops there later on. As for allies, you know, we have a tendency to collect allies like most people collect Facebook friends. We feel really good the more we bring on. But normally, you should acquire an ally if it makes you more secure. You shouldn't acquire allies because you feel like supporting somebody or defending somebody. You should bring on allies who actually advance your own national interests. We have a real cost of a lot of the allies we support, like the Saudis. The question is, what happens there? If we have problems with terrorism, guess what? It's our allies who are the biggest problem, Pakistan and Saudi Arabia. Who's funded these? If we're worried about an Islamic bomb, it's Pakistan. Our allies tend to be the biggest problems that we have. Who has been supportive of the Taliban? It was both Saudi Arabia and Pakistan. Who's made it hard in Afghanistan? It's Pakistan. It's our allies that have been a problem. We shouldn't feel a need to defend countries that can defend themselves. Why should we listen to Turkey when it wants us to get rid of the Assad regime? Turkey has a 400,000 man military. Well, let them use it. Why is it our responsibility to take care of their problems? You know, the point is, allies will always have us do their dirty work. The notion that they will do it only if we lead, they will never do what they need to do as long as we lead. And that's the case of uh, Europe as well. South Korea, Japan, all of these countries are quite happy to have Uncle Sam do this when, in fact, they're prosperous, populous, and have far greater interests at stake. Who should be dealing with ISIS? The countries that are threatened by ISIS have a million men under arms. OK, who is threatened? ISIS has no navy, no uh, air force, no missiles. The people they threaten are local. The folks who should deal with them are, in fact, local. And there's also a role, of course, for allies like the Europeans and others who sit back and say, you protect our oil. Well, maybe it's time for more of a role for them in terms of navy and elsewhere. <laughs> I think if you look at you know, kind of what's happened with American intervention. I would argue that you just go down the list of American interventions, it's hard to argue that these have kind of sustained American interests over time. It's not that one should never act. I think that in 2001, we had to take out the Taliban. You have to make very clear, you take out Al-Qaeda, you also send a message. Governments cannot be host to terrorist states. But you don't have to try to create democracy in Central Asia. But if you look at the Iran coup d'etat in 1953, you look at Lebanon in 1983, a man who I admire and worked for, I think he admitted was his greatest mistake. You look at Iraq in the mid-80s where we're supporting Saddam Hussein and give him an illusion. Why shouldn't he believe he can take Kuwait if we're prepared to support him in his other endeavors? Putting troops into Saudi Arabia after the first Gulf War, Afghanistan sticking around for 13, 14 years, the Iraq invasion, Libya. The question of what's happened, for example, in Yemen, it shows the limits of American military intervention. We can get involved. We can drop drones. We can provide support. It's very hard to control these other societies where what's going on there has an awful lot to do with them and not us. Not everything that goes on in these countries actually is about us. 
The, I think there's little hope, to, there's little reason to hope that the question of the Islamic State is going to turn out a lot better. We've seen all the predecessors. We would not be worried about the Islamic State had we not gone into Iraq in 2003. It's a repetitive process. Yet a new crisis, yet a new crisis. As I pointed out, the Islamic State threatens everyone else in the region. The point is they hate everyone. Well, let everyone deal with it. And we can't very well can't complain about Iran's involvement in Iraq because we blew up the regime of Saddam Hussein, who is anti-Iran, put in place a Shiite majority regime that is allied with Iran. This was predictable. It's hardly surprising. And American involvement after 2011 would not have changed that. These connections are very deep. The current defense minister in Iraq fought with the Iranians against Saddam Hussein. The point is, these connections are very deep. It's not as if we could just stay there and they're going to turn to us. You know, the U.S., I think, would be far better served if it's kept its military at home far more often. The point is not that one never has to use it. There are times one has to use it. But one, I think, should define one's interests much more narrowly, recognizing that America can get away with a lot of things. It doesn't have to worry about every instability and every problem everywhere. We should set... <coughs> far more realistic objectives in terms of what we want to achieve. We aren't going to fix these societies. We aren't going to eradicate the problems. We're not going to create stability. There's nothing in a prior American military intervention that suggests that's going to be the outcome. We should be far more realistic in assessing the effectiveness of military action and what it can achieve, and being realistic about the likely costs and the blowback that's likely to come out of that. The world is going to be a messy place. It has always been a messy place. We can't change that. The question is, are we going to be part of the mess, and are we going to start new messes? And that's what we've managed to do. We need to start stopping creating new problems, because every new problem we create, we will be called upon to solve and solve militarily. In the end of the day, I come back to the military action is different. It's not just another policy option. It's not the same as sanctions. It's not the same as foreign aid. It's not the same as a diplomatic. You put your young people at risk. You put your society at risk. You commit yourself to unpredictable you know, action by loosing the dogs of war. This is not something you do absent compelling justification with the realistic assessment you're likely to get more benefit than not. And it doesn't matter the theory you come up with in terms of how you might be able to do it if in practice what you see repeatedly is failure to achieve what you want to achieve, and repeatedly having to come back to try to fix what you didn't fix last time, you should be skeptical when the next proposal comes along. We have a lot of policymakers who've sold us a lot of bills of goods over the years. Cakewalks, things are going to be easy, everything's going to be wonderful, democracy's going to erupt, and none of that happens. And we're told, well, if you just stayed longer, put in more troops, we're tougher. Well, the American people aren't prepared to support that. And if they aren't, then the question is, what do you do next time? And I'd suggest we should be much more hesitant, much more reluctant, much more humble in our use of the military than we have in recent times. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. As erudite as the opening statements were, uh, now the fun begins. Uh, we now enter a phase of cross-examination. Each individual will have five minutes to cross-examine the other. And we will begin with Max. Well, Doug, you made a very eloquent uh, criticism of interventions, but I'm still unclear about what exactly it is that you advocate. Do you think that we should pull every last soldier, every last airplane, and every last naval vessel that we have out of the Middle East? I would make my policy based on circumstances, which would be some places, yes, not necessarily everything immediately. The same as I would argue elsewhere in the world. I'd pull everything out of South, uh, South Korea, but not tomorrow. I'd phase it out. It strikes me you might want to keep uh, base access. That makes a lot of sense. doesn't necessarily mean you want to have forces based there. I think having base access is good. I think having uh, intelligence relationships, having training relationships with different countries can be useful. 
bearing in mind some of the problems that results in, for example, Bahrain. That uh, you know, we love democracy, we are told, except when it comes to a Shia majority oppressed by a Sunni uh, a royalty, which is supported by the Saudis militarily. These cause problems when we go out and preach human rights. But I don't think that one has to pull everything out tomorrow, but I think we should pull back very substantially. We should avoid new commitments wherever possible. Well, what, you talk about the importance of intelligence relationships or basing rights, but why should countries take the risk of giving us basing rights or sharing intelligence if we're doing as you say and abandoning our, some of our most stalwart allies, whether Saudi Arabia, South Korea, the Philippines, the Baltics, all these other countries, if we're abandoning all of our allies, why should any ally risk anything to help us or why should any ally ever take seriously our word or our pledge or have any desire to cooperate with us ever again? They'll do it if they think it's in their interest. And I certainly don't feel bad cutting off dependent relationships. If countries don't feel it's important to defend themselves, it's not our responsibility to do so. If wealthy nations that are populous and prosperous don't feel like doing so, I'm prepared to take that cutoff. What we have now is a bunch of dependents who depend on the United States to do what is necessary for their own behalf. It makes no sense for us to step in and defend other countries if they are not willing to make that commitment themselves and undertake the effort. In the campaign with ISIL, we're responsible for at least 85% of the airstrikes. Why not more? The UAE and Morocco have stopped their airstrikes. You know, I don't really feel upset if they decide to cut us off if they're not willing to carry the load. Would you have applied, I'm curious, the same logic to World War II? Would you have said that we should not be intervening to help Britain and France because we were launching you know, probably 90% of the airstrikes against Nazi Germany? No, because I think we had an interest to prevent Eurasia being controlled either by Adolf Hitler or Joseph Stalin. But on World War II, you don't start in World War II, you start in World War I. World War I was an idiotic war for us to get involved in. World War II was merely unfinished business of World War I. World War II reminds us of the blowback and the consequences of getting involved in a war that you should not get involved in, where you don't have vital interests, and where you upset a balance of other countries that could have sorted it out. Well, you talk about blowback, but certainly one of the most important blowbacks of, from World War II was the rise of the Cold War, because in fact, World War II left, for example, the Soviet Union in control of all of Eastern Europe and led to the rise of Mao's dictatorship in China. So because there were a lot of unfortunate consequences from World War II, does that suggest to you that we shouldn't have bothered fighting Hitler or Imperial Japan? No, because I think it was important for no power hostile to the United States to control Eurasia. And that could have been either the Soviets or the Nazis. I think that was an ugly contest we had no choice but to be in. The good news is there was only one Adolf Hitler and one Joseph Stalin. And the Islamic State ain't it. The, the kind of existential threat that existed with those kinds of powers does not exist today. That's not terrorism. It's not the Islamic State. The countries around them are well capable of dealing with it in a way that the countries obviously could not deal with either Adolf Hitler or Joseph Stalin. Well, you say that they're well capable of dealing with them, but obviously they're they actually capable or not. They're not dealing with them. So does it matter to you if ISIS continues to take ever more terrain and kill ever more people? Does it matter to you if 200,000 or more people continue to be killed in the Syrian civil war? Does it matter to you if Iran becomes the dominant power in the Middle East with 60% of the world's energy? Are these all possibilities to which you are utterly indifferent? I'm not worried about Islamic State taking over the Middle East because I think they've essentially reached the end. They have existed and grown because of sectarian war in uh, Iraq, which we unleashed. They have grown because of civil war in Syria, which I don't believe we could have stopped. The, uh, of course, it's sad that 200,000 people die in a civil war, but we stood by when 250,000 people died in the Sierra Leone civil war, Liberian civil war. Roughly 4 million people died in war in the Congo in the 2000s, and no one was particularly interested in intervening then. The question is, are we prepared to intervene all the time everywhere? And the question is, under what standards? Iran, of course, is a challenge, but I don't see war as being a good answer to that, which makes it sense to try to come to some diplomatic accommodation, which is why I think the negotiations are worth pursuing. The notion that war with Iran would be a cakewalk, I think, would be a fantasy. It has three times the population of Iraq. I think that it has a much you know, more powerful military. If we at most delay a program as opposed to destroy it, I think the long-term consequences would be catastrophic. So it makes sense to try to stop that, but of course that's one where ironically you have other countries in the region that are also capable, and I would say in Israel with 200 nuclear weapons is well capable of defending itself. I'm really not worried about them dealing with that kind of a threat.
Are you suggesting that Israel should employ nuclear weapons against Iran? No, what I'm saying is that Israel, I think, is capable of defending itself, so we should not be making policy based on defense of Israel. They are capable of making their own defense decisions. Am I correct in understanding from what you've said before that you actually agree with me on the, on the proposition that we're debating that U.S. national interests are, in fact, best advanced by active military intervention because, in fact, you said you agreed with our intervention in Afghanistan, for example, after 9-11, and there are other circumstances in which you would agree. So do I understand it correctly that we're really just arguing about individual cases of where we should intervene or not, but you are actually granting the principle that we should actively intervene militarily when our interests are threatened? I don't think that I would call one intervention in 20 years as being active military intervention. If you'd like to define it that way, feel free. But if we look at the number of interventions over the years, I think Lebanon in 1983 was a disaster. I think that 2001 Afghanistan nation building was wrong. I think that 2003 Iraq was a disaster. I think that 2011 Libya was a big mistake. I think that 2014 Islamic State is a mistake. I believe that entering the Syrian civil war would be insane. I think that one would say that I come out of the negative on the proposition as stated. Well, it seems to me you're arguing, uh, what? Oh, that's it, okay. <laughs> I wish I knew what the last question was. Um, <laughs> and now we'll have uh, Doug for cross-examination. Well, Max, do you think that Ronald Reagan was correct to go into Lebanon in 1983, and having done so, that the proper response to the terrorist attacks would have been to double down, put in U.S. troops, and engage in nation building? I think that the... 1983 U.S. peacekeeping intervention in Lebanon was misbegotten, obviously, because it didn't have a clear purpose and it didn't have robust rules of engagement. Uh, on the other hand, I do think that Ronald Reagan's 1987-1988 uh, intervention to reflag tankers uh, in the Gulf to preserve the freedom of commerce, not simply to help Saddam Hussein, as you said, I think was the right thing to do, even though it led to war with Iran, but it also led Iran to ending the Iraq Iran-Iraq war and ending its attacks on, on commerce. So there's no question if the, if the proposition is that sometimes our interventions in the Middle East are misbegotten, have mistakes, don't work out, absolutely true. I'm not arguing that every single intervention we make is the correct one or every one is perfectly formulated. What I am saying is that I think the consequences of an action and the consequences of isolationism and the consequences of pulling out those consequences are going to be far worse than the mistakes that we suffer from individual interventions like the one in Lebanon in 1983. Was Ronald Reagan an appeaser and an isolationist for pulling forces out after the 1983 Marine Corps bombing? I take second place to nobody in my admiration for Ronald Reagan, whose biography I am actually writing, but I don't believe that Ronald Reagan, just like anybody else, Ronald Reagan was not infallible, and he made mistakes, and I think if you talk to people like George Shultz, which I have done, they will tell you that that was one of the biggest mistakes of the Reagan administration was the way that the 1983 intervention in Lebanon was handled. And generally, this was a blind spot of the Reagan administration dealing with terrorism. This was something that George Shultz advocated that we needed to take a more active role in combating, and the Reagan administration didn't. They tried to appease Iran, which was one of the biggest mistakes they made, a policy that you seem to advocate repeating uh, blew up on the Iran-Contra initiative. That was a horribly misbegotten attempt to try to woo Iran over to our side. We're making the same mistake again today. So, again, I think that Ronald Reagan was generally a great president and pursued a peace through strength policy, which helped to bring down the Soviet Union. But I think his policy in the Middle East was not a model of clarity and foresight, and I think he was not alive to the dangers that were uh, growing in the region. So should he have intensified U.S. military involvement after the Marine Corps barracks to avoid sending signal of weakness? I think that we certainly should have made Hezbollah pay a greater price for blowing up the U.S. Marine barracks and blowing up the U.S. Embassy because when we didn't do that, what happened was Hezbollah and Imad, Imad Mugnia, their number one terrorist who was responsible for those the, the most deadly terrorist attacks pre-9-11, he basically had a hunting license to go out and, and kill. And he was responsible, and Hezbollah was responsible for blowing up a Jewish community center in Buenos Aires in the early 1990s for blowing up the Kobar Towers uh, complex in Saudi Arabia, which housed U.S. military personnel in 1996. So the fact that we allowed them to get away with killing hundreds of Americans set a terrible example, set us back 
and encouraged Iran to further aggression, whereas, as I mentioned before, uh, when we actually got tough uh, in, in the case of Iraq, when we invaded Iraq in 2003, what happened? For the first time ever, Iran actually temporarily stopped their nuclear weapons program because they were afraid of us. And what happened in, when Ronald Reagan in the tanker war reflagged the tankers and went out there and sent the U.S. Navy to take apart the Iranian Navy, the Iranians all of a sudden got afraid of us and ended the Iran-Iraq war. So if we want to deal with Iran right now, uh, which I would certainly be in favor of if we can get it on good terms, we need to make sure that Iran is afraid of us. They're afraid of the consequences of not making a deal. But unfortunately, nobody in Tehran is the least bit afraid of, is the least bit afraid of President Obama because they know he's not going to do anything. He's a guy who allows red lines to be crossed with impunity. And when you do that, uh, it has a catastrophic ability on your, uh, uh, it has a catastrophic impact on your ability to achieve diplomatic results. So it was a good policy to support Saddam Hussein in his war of aggression against Iran, both with intelligence sharing and with uh, reflagging tankers to make sure he got the money to fight his war. I think certainly sometimes you have to make uh, alliances of convenience, just as we allied with Joseph Stalin in order to beat Adolf Hitler. We had to prevent Iran from taking over all of Iraq in the 1980s, and so we had to provide some help to Saddam Hussein, but I was then very much in favor of stopping Saddam Hussein from swallowing Kuwait, which it sounds like he would have been fine with. Now, wouldn't, uh, didn't the fact that he went after Kuwait suggest that he'd learned the wrong lesson from our support? And in fact, having gotten involved to support him, suggested to him that he didn't need to fear us in the question of taking Kuwait. I think the reason, part of the reason why he went into Kuwait was, you're right, because April Glaspie, who was the U.S. ambassador uh, to Baghdad, gave him the impression that we would be fine with letting him take Kuwait that we would not intervene militarily, but I don't see what your beef with that is because you would have sent the same signal. You would have said, hey, Saddam, go right ahead and swallow Kuwait, and while you're at it, help yourself to Saudi Arabia so that you will then control 60% of the world's oil supply. I don't know how you would have stopped that, Doug, without American military intervention. I would not have sent uh, U.S. military support and aided him in his war against Iran. That's an irrelevant the question. Then. That's an irrelevant question. No, it isn't. That clearly had an impact on his thinking. You believe that... Um, and there's any military By the way, notice that Doug is saying that he would have been opposed to the U.S. intervention in the Gulf War, so he would have been okay with Saddam Hussein swallowing Kuwait and then attacking Saudi Arabia. Am I right? Well, I think that Saudi Arabia should be defending itself. All right, so and if they're not defending themselves, well, good luck to them and too bad. Well, I think the, you know, some uh, powers deserve that if they're not prepared to take their own steps on their own uh, right. defense. Well, that's an ideological policy, which I don't think we no, can afford. No, it's a very practical policy. I love it. <laughs> For my students, this is the essence of civil discourse. This is where it should be done. At first, I thought I wouldn't have a question to ask anyone, and now I'm going to have to limit them. The United States is at a time right now where in Congress and in the populace in general, we have a lower percentage of people that are veterans than ever before, certainly in a long time. As I look around this room, I see a lot of people that I know and a lot of people that I don't that are about my age. And my question to both of you is this. My first question is, intervention is easy to say when you're not the one doing it. Wars historically are fought for the overclass by the underclass. Would you support returning a draft? without, with very few exceptions, unlike Vietnam, with very few exceptions and exemptions. First. Well, first off, Jim, I take exception to your, to your characterization that uh, our wars are fought by the underclass. I mean, you yourself just proved that because you were a naval officer. I doubt that you would consider yourself as being part of the underclass. Certainly, I've spent a lot of time traveling with the U.S. military in Iraq and Afghanistan, and I don't think I'm encountering the underclass. In fact, what you're encountering is a very solid slice of, of middle-class America. Uh, most people are not eligible for military service because they, have a high they don't have a high school degree. They don't meet the, uh, the, uh, the physical fitness requirements. They don't meet the, the, the clean record requirements, all sorts of reasons. So the people who are defending us are not by any means the underclass. They are the volunteers, and they are some of the very best among us. Uh, I personally do not favor a draft. Uh, unless we face a, a, an adversary much bigger than the one we face today. I mean, remember 
that in World War II, when we had a population roughly a third the size of the one we have today, we had a military of some 12 million people with a draft. Well, if you multiply that by three and you create a draft with no exemptions and everybody serves, you would have a military of 36 million people. And the question is, what the heck would you do with all those people? You would bankrupt yourself just trying to train, arm, and equip them. We don't need an army of 36 million people. I mean, I think we need a somewhat, I, I think it's a mistake to downsize the armed forces as we're doing now. I think we're creating a dangerous uh, vulnerability, but we certainly don't need tens of millions of, of people under arms. Today we have the greatest military we've ever had in the history of this country, professional, all-volunteer forces, extremely high quality. They've been through the cauldron. Uh, they've, they've suffered terribly, but their cohesion, their morale has actually stayed very strong. In fact, I think it's despite all the problems caused by uh, with stress from repeated deployments, I think one of the biggest causes of stress in the U.S. military today is the fact, and I know this talking to a lot of veterans, they're heartbroken to see the fact that they and their buddies fought so hard in places like Fallujah and Mosul, and then they won the battle. They defeated the bad guys, and now we pulled out and let the bad guys take over. That, to me, is a horrible precedent to set. No, I, I think... Uh, you know, a free society demands a military that's volunteer. I think that's the way a free society should defend itself. I think Max is absolutely right in the way he characterizes the force. It's a middle-class force. It's high quality. It's college-capable. The educational achievement actually of uh, you know, current, uh, and of course, we're just looking at en enlistees as opposed to officer corps. Officer corps is largely uh, college-educated, but you know, en enlistees are a higher educational quality than students, uh, you know, young people generally. You know, you can't get in if you're a Category 5. You can't get in if you don't have a high school education. It's a very good, high-quality force. You know, you would have to downgrade the quality if you decided you wanted to go to conscription. I have no idea what you would do with 4 million-plus young people who turn 18 every year, even if you wanted to have civilian service as well. And I don't think you can compare, you know, shelving books at a library and serving in the military. I don't think there's any civilian service that would be comparable. I don't think that conscription would stop stupid interventions. You know, the Vietnam was fought with the draft. You know, conscription machine is very powerful. It brings in a lot of folks. It's hard to stop. And look, if, you're, if you have influence, if you have access, if, you have, if daddy is you know, powerful, you end up in the typing pool as opposed to in combat. There are ways even within the military to avoid the tough you know, things. What we have today is young people volunteer to be in combat arms. I think it would be a mistake. We have a very good, high-quality force. The ultimate choice, this question is, do you want a military where people want to be there? Or do you want a military where people want out? Which one is likely over the long term to perform better, to be better trained, to do the job? And I would argue it's one where people want to be in. And that's what we have today. So I definitely would keep a volunteer military. Glad we agree about yeah, something. something. <laughs> Seconds for the five minutes. That sucks. <laughs> <laughs> You're the moderator. You can take it. You're damn through. right. Yeah. <laughs> First, don't assume I'm not an underclass. Anybody whose family comes from Possum Grape, Arkansas is in the underclass. <laughs> um, this is directed to you, Max. Um, you talked about the Asian pivot. Uh, with the disintegration of Iraq, the Asian pivot, the destabilization of the Middle East, to what degree as a unipolar hegemon do we run the risk of becoming uh, susceptible to imperial overstretch? That's done in many of our um, predecessors. I don't think there's much risk of imperial overstretch when we are spending well under 4% of our gross domestic product on defense. Now, during the Cold War for decades, we spent an average of 7 to 8% on defense, going up considerably during periods of wartime. Uh, today, less than 20% of the federal budget goes to defense. Less than 4% of our GDP goes to defense. So we're not bankrupting ourselves with our military spending. Far from it. We all know what's bankrupting this country. It's not the armed forces. It's the entitlement programs. We've got to get the entitlement spending under control if we want to do something about our deficit and our debt. That's the real threat to our long-term economic prosperity. It's not defense because, in fact, defense is a very cheap insurance policy, four, less than four cents on the dollar of our economy, an insurance policy against terrible wars breaking out with uh, with, uh, with aggression caused by Putin and Russia or by China trying to claim more territory or by ISIS spreading across the Middle East. These are all major threats in major areas of economic production and wealth around the world. 
where we can't afford to allow extremists and anti-American actors to gain control of those resources. And if we can prevent that from happening, if we can ensure freedom of navigation, if we can ensure a peaceful and secure international environment, that's something that allows our economy to grow and prosper. That sets the conditions for our own prosperity at home. And again, at less than four cents on the dollar, that is something we can easily afford. Yeah, I think it's, it's extraordinary that in today's world we spend more, you know, as much in real terms as we did during the Cold War. It's important to realize that 1% you know, of GDP today means a lot more than it once did. 1% of GDP today is something like 12 times what it was in 1945, something like eight times what it was uh, during the, the uh, Korean War. So if you're comparing relative spending, you want to bear that in mind. 1% of GDP today buys an awful lot more than it did you know, back then. The question is, are there similar threats today that require us to have the kind of military spending that we had during the Cold War, the Korean War, and the Vietnam War? And I'd argue no. The good news is the Soviet Union as an enemy where we're worried about the full the gap and you know, armored divisions pouring forth where we're thinking about nuclear war is over. Maoist China is over. The world we live in is very different. And the good news is we have allies who can defend themselves. You know, the Europeans have a greater GDP and population than us. They have eight times the GDP of Russia. Who should worry about Putin's Russia? Why do we have to babysit the Europeans? You know, the South Koreans have 40 times the GDP of North Korea. I mean, this makes no sense. That this is something where we need to turn these responsibilities over to others. We bore the burden when we had to. The world has changed. Let's change our military policy. When I thought I wouldn't have any questions, I have six pages, but we don't have time. <laughs> uh, one thing we can agree on, though, I do agree with you, that we should uh, rein in entitlements. Um, I'm all for ending corporate welfare. Um, all right, we're now going to have a 10-minute break. If you have a question, please raise your hand and someone, I don't know who, someone will pass out cards uh, and uh, they'll bring them up to me, okay?
Ed, attention on deck. I usually work with my students. So. All right, uh, first, um, an administrative note. For those students that are filling out surveys, if you'd be so kind, at the bottom of the survey, indicate who you think won the debate. And one thing that I think is long overdue that I think is critically important. Uh, Glenn Moots has uh, gone to Herculean uh, extents to pull this off. And this is the exact kind of thing that true universities do. And I think we need to give Glenn Moots a round of applause for doing it. OK. Um, there are a ton of really, really great questions. Unfortunately, we only have a limited amount of time. What we've decided to do is shorten, perhaps, the closing statement so we have more time for questions and answers from both of them. The first question is very short uh, and to the point, and I think it's an excellent question. This relates, obviously, to potential intervention. If China were to attack Taiwan, should the U.S. send in military aid? If so, under what conditions? Next. Well, we are, in fact, pledged to uh, defend Taiwan from military attack, and I think it's absolutely important that we do that because Taiwan is a small democracy next to a giant illiberal state, and I think it would be, in the first place, a deeply immoral policy to allow uh, the people of Taiwan, a vibrant democracy, to be swallowed by military force. And in the second place, it would be a deeply st stupid strategic mistake to make because Chinese ambitions would not end with, uh, with Taiwan. Uh, having swallowed Taiwan and seeing that it was able to push the U.S. around and to get its way by military force, uh, China would be likely to use military force against Vietnam, against Singapore, against the Philippines, against Japan, all of its countries on its periphery with whom it, or against India, all of these countries with whom it has territorial disputes. And we would be back into a doggy dog world, which I don't think we can afford. By the way, this is the same reason why, why I think it's a tragic mistake to allow Putin to swallow so much of Ukraine, not just because of what it means for the people of Ukraine, but what it means for the larger principle of international law and upholding uh, uh, the basic principles of collective security in the world. I think the Taiwan is a country that deserves to be independent. That's the reality. On the other hand, it lives in an, a bad neighborhood. And it uh, you know, lives next to a neighbor that views it as part of the neighbor. And indeed, it's not just Communist Party apparatchiks. It's liberal students who I talk to who don't like Internet censorship, who like democracy, but they also believe that China owns Taiwan. The question ultimately is, are you prepared to play chicken with the nuclear armed power? What risks are you willing to take for interests that are perceived as vital by another country and much less important for your own? And I think this is the challenge. As one Chinese general told an American official years ago, are you prepared to risk Los Angeles for Taipei? The point is a nuclear armed power is a very different kind of creature than bombing Serbia or Iraq or taking out you know, a country that doesn't have retaliatory capabilities. You know, how far are you prepared to go? I think we have to ask that. Are we prepared to go to war with China over Taiwan? It would be an extraordinary thing to do. We wouldn't be supported, I think, elsewhere in the region. The Europeans certainly would not get involved militarily. And we have to recognize how unpredictable these things become. If we send a, a fleet into the Taiwan Strait, what if the Chinese are able to sink one of our carriers? What China is trying to do now is deterrence. They're not going to attack us, but they want to deter us. Missiles and subs that can sink American carriers is a lot more cost effective than building new carriers. So I think it would be extraordinarily risky. I think we have to ask is what are we prepared for war with with a great power? And that's what we'd be talking about in this case. You better make sure you really think that's vitally important, and I'm not convinced it is. Thank you. All right. Uh, let's try this. This is a slightly longer question. Do either of you think that peaceful intervention or aggressive diplomacy should be pursued specifically, and what should be our policy to the peace process or whatever remains of it between Israel and Palestine. Doug? Well, we've been spending quite a few years trying to bring peace there. Uh, you know, whenever a, a Secretary of State heads off on a new initiative, I'm skeptical uh, that an awful lot's going to come from it. 
Certainly we would all benefit if there was peace. Certainly the Israelis and Palestinians would benefit most if there was peace. We would benefit as well. I think we have to recognize whatever involvement we have in the process, we will never be viewed as an honest broker. I mean, the reality is we're a supporter of Israel. We're, we do not have the same commitment to Palestinians. There is no reason why Palestinians should look at us as being an honest broker. And I think that's always going to make it more difficult in many ways for us in terms of promoting a peace process. The, the issues there are extraordinarily deep, extraordinarily complex, and you could have a debate on that issue alone. I think that uh, the record shows that Israel is ready for peace. It's given up vast amounts of land, uh, whether it was giving up the Sinai to uh, uh, Egypt uh, for the 1978 Camp David Accord or giving up its control of uh, the Gaza Strip in 2005. It has made substantial sacrifices for peace. And they have not been reciprocated because half of uh, the Palestinian lands are controlled by Hamas, which is a frankly genocidal organization which is committed to wiping Israel off the face of the earth. And the other half is controlled by the Palestinian Authority, which is a corrupt organization which also has not fully and truly accepted Israel's right to exist and is also implicated in supporting terrorism, as we saw from a recent legal judgment against the Palestinian Authority holding them liable for supporting terrorism. So under those circumstances, I think, and this is where Doug and I agree. I think that attempts by one American Secretary of State after another to rush in and broker a peace are doomed to failure. Just one quick follow-on, if I could, Doug, or uh, Max. Um, you mentioned is Israel's willingness to, uh, to make concessions. Would that include building continued settlements in the West Bank? I don't think that the uh, settlements are the issue uh, because, in fact, Israel during the Camp David process in uh, 2000 offered to give up 95% or even more of the West Bank to Palestinian Authority sovereignty once a final agreement had been struck. Yasser Arafat declined that deal. Uh, Israel has made clear that it was that, I mean, first off, you can't talk about the West Bank as a unitary entity. Part of it is really the suburbs of Jerusalem where I think there's general recognition that if and when you actually have a final status agreement, you will see uh, property offsets with the Israelis incorporating some blocks around Jerusalem and giving the Palestinians compensatory land from elsewhere. Uh, but I think that kind of deal is only possible if you have a Palestinian interlocutor who is truly ready and willing and able to make peace. Arafat was not willing to do that in 2000. I don't think there's much evidence that either uh, Mahmoud Abbas and the Palestinian Authority or Hamas are willing to do that today. So. I think it's a red herring to focus on Israeli settlements when I think the issue is the fact that uh, Palestinians have not truly accepted Israel's right to exist as a Jewish state. This question has appeared three times, and I, we talked about it briefly before the debate, uh, questioning whether it actually uh, was directly on point. But since it's appeared three times, I think it warrants at least a brief comment from each of you. Um, and the question generally is relative to the propriety of Benjamin Netanyahu's uh, appearance tomorrow before a joint session of Congress. Is that going to further or is it going to um, uh, further deteriorate American-Israeli uh, relationships? Well, the relationship is very strong, I think, certainly with the Congress, with, uh, I mean, you know, the American people have a great deal of sympathy with Israel. I mean, this administration and Benjamin Netanyahu do have not had a good relationship for a long time. I'm not convinced that what's going on right now is going to have substantial long-term impact. I, mean, I do believe that the only reason the Congress has invited him is political. I don't, I don't think, I mean, it, it's quite obvious what he thinks about the issue of negotiation with Iran. He doesn't have to come for that. But I, I don't think that it's likely to have a major substantive impact on U.S.-Israeli relations. I think this is much more political theater. It's gamesmanship with the administration and Capitol Hill much more than it has to do with anything substantive in terms of U.S.-Israeli relations, and I don't think that next year or the year beyond anybody will be thinking much of it. And with the new president, I think it'll be ancient history. I think that this is a corrosive and dangerous dispute between allies, uh, for which I hold to some extent both, to some extent, Prime Minister Netanyahu, although primarily President Obama responsible. I think that uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu certainly has every right to address a joint session of Congress but he would have been better advised to have coordinated that better with the White House beforehand. Um, now, I think that President Obama 
should not be going out there, and he and his aides should not be going out there in public and blasting uh, one of America's closest allies on this issue uh, in a way that they never do with actual rogue states like Iran. I wish that Susan Rice and President Obama would show half as much anger with Ayatollah Khamenei as they show with Prime Minister Netanyahu, the elected leader of one of America's closest allies. I think both sides have mishandled it, but I think the, uh, the blame rests primarily uh, with the Obama administration, which is, I think, more hostile to Israel than any administration in my lifetime. And they are really hell-bent on getting an agreement with Iran, which by all indications is going to be a bad agreement that will allow Iran to have a so-called right to a nuclear program. And they are basically trying to demagogue this and turn this into a partisan issue and to make it seem as if it's only Prime Minister Netanyahu uh, and uh, Israel who are interested in stopping this agreement, whereas I think there are a lot of solid reasons why anybody who's concerned about the future of, of world security and American security as well as Israel's security should be worried about the deal with Iran uh, that the administration seems determined to conclude. Last, last question, and I'm going to change this slightly. This is clearly not one of my students. Uh, ISIL. Um, <laughs> to what degree does ISIL pose an existential threat to Europe, to the United States, and should the United States be willing to engage in, in boots-on-the-ground military intervention relative to ISIL? Well, I mean, I think it depends on how you define existential threat. I mean, if, if you take those words literally and you're talking about a, a power that has the ability to wipe out the United States, no, obviously, because the only power, powers that probably can do that in the world today are Russia and China because they have arsenals of hundreds of nuclear-armed ICBMs. But is ISIS or ISIL or whatever you want to call it, are they a major threat to American interest? Absolutely, uh, because... They are taking over a huge chunk of the Middle East. They are destabilizing the region. They are committing atrocities. Uh, they are a force of evil, which is inimical to uh, everything that America stands for and all of our interests in the Middle East. Uh, so I do believe that they justify a commitment of some American personnel on the ground. President Obama, by the way, has already conceded the principle by sending 3,000 U.S. advisors to Iraq. I think we need to boost the number of advisors and I think we need to let them operate under more effective rules of engagement, similar to those that uh, our special operations forces used in Afghanistan in the fall of 2001, when they were able to go out in the field with the Northern Alliance to direct airstrikes and thereby be very effective. If we keep our advisors on bases in Iraq, they're not going to be very effective. And we should not be letting Iran and its Iranian-backed militias take the lead in fighting ISIS because they're not going to defeat ISIS. They're going to consign Iraq and Syria to perpetual civil war, which is going to have grievous repercussions for uh, the United States and for the entire region. It's clearly not an existential threat. I mean, the reality is there's no Navy, there's no Army of note, you know, there is no Air Force, there are no nuclear weapons, there are no missiles. You know, they don't even have, as far as we can tell, a, a terrorist capability beyond you know, Americans who are unfortunate enough to travel to the region and fall into their hands. They're clearly evil. I mean, that's without question. But if you start thinking about existential threats, they certainly ain't it. Um, and there are lots of forces of evil. I mean, if we want to eradicate evil from the world, we're going to be very busy. I mean, we could certainly, you know, I mean, there are a lot of places in the Middle East we could go. I think the issue is, who do they most threaten? Well, they threaten countries in the region that have about a million men under arms. And we have to realize why they've risen. They've risen because, especially in Iraq, there's sectarian conflict going on, which we are not going to be able to resolve. Even today, the government that we support relies on its own Shia militias that kill Sunnis. The reason that Mosul fell was not so much because of ISIL, it was because of Sunni tribes who did not like the Shia uh, military, and they turned to the Sunni, you know, ISIL, for defense, for military purposes. They decided that they'd you know, live at least in the current, you know, currently with the 7th century guys because they would put the national guys out of business. I think over time that ISIL is going to find it reaches the end where it's not expanding. The allure of this in terms of bringing people in is going to fade. And we're not going to be able to stop the Iranians from being involved. Iran has a very close relationship with Iraq. 
that we facilitated by getting rid of Saddam Hussein and putting in power a Shia you know, prime minister who has ties with these people. I mean, that's simply not going to change. If somebody's going to be killed on the ground, I'd prefer that it be Shia you know, militias from Iran than it be American forces. This is their struggle much more than our struggle. All right, and with that, I see that we've reached the end of the time allotted for um, Q&A. So, gentlemen, we'll have closing statements now. Doug. Well, it's been great fun. It, uh, it is, I think, Glenn deserves credit for trying to have a, a substantive conversation on some very deep issues. You know, we have you know, decades of experience of military activity in the Middle East. And I would argue most of them, you know, look back and see what they have wrought. And what that has come out of them has not been terribly positive. It certainly has not been effective at advancing American military interests. Go back to the coup d'etat in 1953 in Iran. And I think ultimately it gave us Khomeini. It gave us support for Saddam Hussein. It gave us involvement of troops in Saudi Arabia. It gave us many things out of that that we never would have imagined coming. Look at the Lebanon War. I mean, the good news was it didn't give us as many bad consequences because we left, as opposed to trying to stay and remake the place and intervene. You know, the Afghan war, we did what we had to do very quickly, get rid of the Taliban and get rid of the uh, al-Qaeda. But after that, the question is, then what? A strong central government, democracy in Central Asia. What do we have today? What kind of government? What's likely to endure? You know, in a place that... Uh, is of interest to us, but far greater interest to its neighbors. The 2003 Iraq adventure, I would argue, was a great disaster. 4,500 dead Americans, 150, 200,000 dead Iraqis, Christian community destroyed, many of them forced to Syria. You know, millions of people dispersed within the country, creation of a sectarian government, increased the role of Iran, the creation of ISIL, all of these things coming out of that, leading to, of course, all the problems now that we have to intervene yet again in. <laughs> the Libya war, you know, a desire to get rid of uh, Gaddafi, <laughs> leaving what people are now talking about, Somalia on the Med. Two different governments, two different parliaments, multiple factions, ISIL showing up, slaughtering Coptic Egyptian workers. You know, look at Yemen trying to make that work and what's happened there with the, the rise of the Houthis who are, tend to be uh, uh, affiliated with Iran. Not the sort of thing it's obvious how we could have stopped. And then ISIL, I just am very skeptical that we're going to have a better outcome, that we can kind of balance all the Sunni and Shia interests, we can get in the middle of a sectarian war, that we can find a way, especially policy in Syria, where we seem to presume that we can back the moderates who always seem to lose, and when they surrender, they surrender to the radicals, and that they can defeat both the radicals and Assad, how all this can work together. I'm very skeptical Washington can put together. I think it's time for a very different approach. Not isolationism, but non-interventionism is the right term. We should be fully engaged in the world in terms of trade, in terms of people going abroad, in terms of immigration, in terms of culture and politics. But military should be the last resort. We should stay out of disputes that are not vital or critical to ourselves. We should recognize the limits of our ability to affect other countries. We have this illusion that if the president speaks, others will listen. I loved as a uh, you know, revolution is hitting you know, Egypt and the administration first declares how much we love Mubarak. And that didn't work. He's going to go down, so we decide we want to have kind of a, an orderly process of him being defenestrated. Well, that doesn't seem to work, and we finally decide how much we love him. And then, of course, Morsi, the uh, Muslim Brotherhood, is elected, and we love him. And then there's a coup d'etat, but we can't call it a coup d'etat. And we've kind of come around and more or less embraced the Egyptians, even as we're a little uncomfortable with what they're doing today, because it's, in fact, more repressive than it was under Mubarak. What control do we have in these places? Yemen, Saudi Arabia. You know, we should learn that there are places where you stay out and you shut up if you can't control events. We should add allies when they help us. We shouldn't feel the need to defend everyone all the time. Indeed, their defense should be primarily their responsibility, not ours. That indeed, if we, why do we always beg and curry favor? Why do we find the need to constantly convince our allies that they can rely upon us when in fact, they, we, they should be, uh, we should be relying on them. They should be doing things helping us as opposed to us helping them. We also should think about incentives. If you're always going to act, others won't act. They don't have an incentive to do so. That, uh, and if you act, you're going to elevate the struggle. Why does ISIL you know, want to have the US involved? It transforms an intra-inter 
kind of Muslim dispute into one with the great Satan, with America. It transforms you know, a dispute. We should always consider alternatives to military action, recognizing at times how limited they can be, but nevertheless try to match the importance of interest with alternatives. We should remember history, how often we've botched different interventions, what's come out of those. And we shouldn't hesitate not to act. Obviously, there are consequences of not acting, but we should recognize that, number one, they're more predictable than acting. What we know now is, if you look at the history of intervention, stuff happens. It doesn't matter where we go, under what circumstance, stuff happens, most of which we never anticipate, most of which seems to require that we come back again. The blowback, the unintended consequences, that at least by not acting, we don't violate the pottery barn rule, as Colin Powell put it, of breaking all the pottery. Moreover, if we don't act, we're not responsible for all these new consequences. Of course, we're constantly told, well, if you go in there, you broke it, now you have to fix it. You went in there and destroyed Iraq, so obviously you have to fix it. You went in there into Afghanistan, you must create a new government. You went in there and got rid of Gaddafi, so you should have stuck around to fix you know, Libya. Getting involved creates all sorts of new consequences. We should learn, as the physicians are told, to first do no harm. Be much more realistic to think about the likely consequences. You know, sometimes you have to use the military. It is necessary, but not nearly as often as we do. You know, military intervention is different than other forms of intervention. It's very different from other forms of policy. It's more costly to use. It's more costly when it goes awry. So overall, an active military policy, meaning constant intervention, constant involvement, has not been an effective way to advance American interests. Thank you. I think my friend Doug Bandow is laboring under a misapprehension. When we talk about active military intervention, we're not necessarily talking about going to war. A lot of what we do actively with the military is keeping the peace. Just think about the fact that our forces have been stationed in countries like Germany, Japan, and South Korea for more than half a century. They've been stationed in Bosnia and Kosovo uh, for some 20 years now. Those are all uh, actions that Doug undoubtedly opposed, and as in fact he, he let us know in the, in the last hour or so. Yet those troops have not suffered a single casualty over the last 60 plus years by being deployed in countries like Italy, Germany, Japan, South Korea, and elsewhere. They have kept the peace. They have prevented war from breaking out, which is exactly what happened after we withdrew all of our troops from Europe after World War I in 1919. We brought the boys home, and what happened? Within 20 years, the boys were back in Europe because war broke out. That didn't happen in the post-World War II era because the greatest generation was smart enough to understand that the way to keep the peace, that the way to preserve our security was to stay actively involved militarily, to create alliances like NATO, to have close relationships with allies around the world, not to abandon our allies, as Doug suggests, doing with practically every U.S. ally under the sun, but to stand with them to defend the cause of freedom. That is a policy that helped to win the Cold War. It is a policy that I submit to you can win the war today against violent Islamist extremism. You know, Doug talks about his mantra, his slogan is, we shouldn't hesitate not to act. Well, you know what? Last time I checked, that could be a pretty good description of the Obama foreign policy. President Obama has hesitated not to act. He, he did not hesitate to put out a red line in Syria and then not back it up. He did not hesitate to pull all U.S. troops out of Iraq in 2011. He did not act. Was the result of all of that this wonderful libertarian paradise that Doug imagines, where the Middle East becomes self-regulating, all the countries take care of their own problems, and peace and harmony breaks out, and everybody sings kumbaya? Is that what happened? Maybe in some alternative universe, to which I am not privy, in the actual universe in which we live, the one I'm familiar with, what has happened during this policy of hesitating not to act, what has happened is an, a tr one atrocity after another. If you like seeing pictures on the big screen of Americans being beheaded, if you like seeing pictures of a Jordanian pilot being burned alive, if you like seeing pictures of 3,000-year-old antiquities being destroyed, then go right ahead and vote for Doug and support the cause of hesitating not to act. That is, in fact, what happens when we don't act.
I would suggest to you that if we don't act, the world will become a very, very dangerous place. And when we don't act to defend Taiwan, when we don't act to defend Israel, when we don't act to defend Saudi Arabia, when we don't act to defend Ukraine and Poland and the Baltic Republics and the Philippines, when we act nowhere around the world, pretty soon we're going to find the enemy is right here on our shores, that we have lost all credibility, we have lost all deterrence, we have lost all ability to maintain our own security, that we are back into the world of the 1930s where the world will be prey to the most vicious aggressors in the world. And yes, there is not a Hitler today. That is true. But do you think that Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, the emir of the Islamic Caliphate in Syria and Iraq, do you think that he is not the same kind of moral monster that Adolf Hitler was? Do you think there's anything morally that separates him from people like Hitler? The only thing that separates him is a lack of power. He does not have quite as much power as Adolf Hitler had in the 1940s. Although, by the way, by Doug's standard of an existential threat, Nazi Germany was not really an existential threat to the United States. How is Hitler going to annihilate the United States? So I think if you actually apply Doug's case to the 40s, you would say we wouldn't even act against Hitler. But in the present situation, I would submit to you whether Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi and ISIS, whether they are an existential threat to us now or not, is irrelevant. They are a clear and growing threat. And if history shows anything, it is that when we are dealing with people as depraved, as evil, and as power-hungry as Baghdadi and his crew in ISIS, we cannot allow them to continue accumulating power unchecked. Doug may imagine in this alternative universe uh, that I am not familiar with that somehow if we pull back, countries like Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates and Jordan and others will gang up and knock ISIS to the ground. In the world that I live in, the actual reality of the Middle East, what will happen and what is in fact happening is they will reach an accommodation with ISIS and they will back ISIS as a bulwark against the Iranian threat. And you will see the Middle East torn apart by this vicious civil war with no good outcome for the United States because both the Iranians, both the Shiite extremists and the Sunni extremists, they are united by only one thing, and that is hatred of the great Satan. And if there is some way that we can prevent that from happening at reasonable cost, and I believe that there is, then we should certainly take that path. We should not repeat the mistakes of the past, and we should not retreat into this isolationist fairyland where our motto, where our motto becomes, don't hesitate not to act. We need to act to protect our interests. And if we don't, we will pay a heavy price in the future, as we have already paid all too often in the past, and as we are, in fact, paying right now. You know that you've encountered a, a good book or a good movie or a good dinner date or a fine bottle of wine when you're sad because it ends. And uh, you wish it could last longer. And uh, such is the nature of this evening and this debate. I think uh, more than anything, we should give our participants a round of applause. We'd like to thank you for coming. We hope you found this beneficial and stimulating, and um, we'll look forward to seeing you at the next presentation.